Is the global financial crisis behind us, or is there another steep plunge on the economic roller coaster ahead of us? I have a member of the European Parliament on the telephone right now. Mr. Godfrey Bloom is a top lieutenant in the United Kingdom Independence Party, which is now the fourth biggest political party in the U.K., In addition to his seat in the European Parliament, Mr. Bloom is the president of the European Alliance for Freedom. His official website is godfreybloommep.co.uk. Mr. Bloom, welcome to True News. Oh, and uh, hello to you and all your listeners, and a great pleasure to be invited on. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, congratulations to you and Nigel Farage and and the people of Great Britain who have confounded the, the establishment with the UKIP's stunning election victories in town council races last uh, last month. I, I got to tell you, I, I thoroughly enjoyed reading the London papers and, and seeing the expression of shock and dismay uh, on the establishment faces as the little people of UK stood up and said, we don't want any more of your rule over this country. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Yes, it's been a long, hard fight. We sort of started in the mid-90s and... Uh, We've been working enormously hard ever since, Uh, and and yes, and the breakthrough came, and I think there's more to come. The European elections, uh, which favour us for a number of reasons, but particularly the electoral system is proportional representation, so, uh, you know, it's one man, one vote, what you see is what you get, not the party system first by the post, so it suits us, uh, and I think we're going to be the top party uh, in May of next year. In fact, uh, I bet on that some... uh, some years ago, and uh, it looks like that's going to come true. Well, we're going to be uh, watching it from this side of the Atlantic. I want to ask you regarding uh, these opening news stories that I had in the introduction. Is the is the global economic crisis behind us, as the uh, news media is telling us, or is there another dip ahead? Uh, no, I'm afraid we're staring into the abyss. Uh, I sit on the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee in the European Parliament, uh, and one of the problems that we have uh, is obviously it's a lay committee, um, as you would expect, made up of uh, uh, politicians from uh, all over 27 different countries, and none of them have any serious understanding how international uh, banking works. Uh, so they're clutching at straws, they don't understand it, and of course neither do our elected politicians, even very senior politicians indeed in Europe and uh, in North America, simply don't understand uh, what is happening, and they're bewildered, and they think that they can print money. They can print their way out of this by counterfeiting money, which of course is absolutely absurd. Uh, But they're still not talking about what they need to do, which of course is a root and branch reform of the international banking system. And until they do that, nothing's going to get better. We've learned nothing from the 2000 and 2008 crisis. We've learned absolutely nothing, and therefore certainly all this must happen again and i think probably rather sooner than later now that we had this report just days ago ambrose evans uh prichard in the telegraph said um this uh, the second biggest bank of italy said that there is a uh, a crisis coming within the next six months that italy will need a bailout and then last week a french think tank uh in, in their newsletter said that there will be another global financial crisis in the second half of 2013. Um, do you think that are we are we this close to another event like the 2008 Lehman Brothers collapse? Uh, well, timing is, of course, is a difficult thing, isn't it? We, yes. we know the world's going to end one day, but we don't quite know when. Uh, we do know that there's going to be a much bigger, a much deeper collapse of the banking and currency system. But whether it's in the ne- second half of uh, 2013, I couldn't say, or 2014, or even 2015, getting the timing right. But one thing we do know, it's going to happen uh, because they have made ref- made no reform. So until they reform banking, we need to split the difference between deposit banking and investment banking, that's step one, Uh, and we must, of course, get back to hard money. Uh, We've got to get back to, in 1971, when the Bretton Woods uh, dissolved and the uh, United States went off the gold system, uh, it was an open uh, opportunity for politicians to print money, which is precisely what they did. I mean, I would argue 
that if you've got a little, or any of your listeners have a little machine in their attic to turn the handle, even if they knew that they had to make a Faustian pact with the devil, uh, but it would print dollars, sooner or later, no matter how well-intentioned they are, they would use that little machine in the attic. Now, they're ordinary good people, good middle American people. Uh, They would be tempted to do it. And, of course, uh, politicians in the main, uh, are all crooks and charlatans, with, of course, the noble exception of myself. Uh, And so they will continue to turn the handle uh, and print and counterfeit money. uh, And sooner or later, of course, people will no longer want that medium of exchange. It must eventually lead to hyperinflation. And we'll see not just in uh, America and Europe, but we will see the same sort of phenomenon that we saw in the Weimar Republic in Germany in the 1920s. It's as sure as eggs, but quite when, I I wouldn't like to guess. Yes, because we've never witnessed anything like this in world history. We we have seen individual nations go off the deep end and print, print, print money. And as you say, they they go into um, hyperinflation, but we've never seen multiple nations do it simultaneously. And so we really don't have, you know, an economic textbook that we can go back to and say, look, this is what happens when groups of nations coordinate their money printing. So we're really in uncharted waters and nobody really knows how this is going to end. Uh, We know it's not going to be a pretty ending, but we really don't know what's going to happen. You're quite, Rick, you've put your finger right on the button. Um, in the Weimar Republic, you know, there, was, there were other currencies. There was the franc, which was reasonably strong. There was the pound, which was reasonably strong, and the United States dollar. You know, there were other areas of the world. Uh, now you're quite right. What we have is central banks of all countries defrauding uh, the, the currency system, the Fed, Uh, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of China, the Bank of England is no better. And getting back to this guess on maybe an Italian bank going down in in the next few months, uh, all the banks, when you have a fractional reserve banking system, all the banks are broke. Uh, So the the Santander are broke. Uh, The Royal Bank of Scotland uh, continues to be broke. All these banks are broken because of a f- fractional reserve system. And, of course, with Basel III, and we've had Basel I, Basel II, we've had banking regulation, and all they're doing is arguing about whether the reserve should be 10% or 11% or 9%. And, of course, we know that with fractional reserve banking, even if we went to a 10% reserve, um, a 10% reserve would still give us a bank which was 90% broke. Uh, And, uh, of course, interest rates are at zero. Uh, Unemployment uh, is rampant in Europe uh, because of uh, these diverse economies uh, crammed into one currency. So it's already falling apart. And, of course, in the Iberian Peninsula uh, and Greece, you're talking about 50% youth unemployment. No society is sustainable when 50% of your young people are out of work. It just isn't sustainable. Uh, So we're going to see, and of course the Mediterranean countries uh, are very volatile. And if you look at their histories, if you look at the terror, uh, the French Revolution, uh, if you look at Italy, which is a relatively new country, um, only relatively recently united in historical terms, civil war in Spain, of course, in living memory, um, or just about living memory, a fascist regime, regime was there. And of course, what will happen in chaos, what happens whenever you get an economy in chaos, people turn to an authoritarian, totalitarian, totalitarian regime. So they won't turn to libertarianism, which is what you and I would wish, uh, and to go back to hard money. Uh, they will turn and you will find a fascist or neo-fascist or status system comes in its place. Sure as eggs. Last, uh, last year, there was a report out of Switzerland that the Swiss army was preparing for European social unrest or even war on the continent. In your position in the European Parliament, uh, have you heard any additional information about the Swiss preparation? Um, nothing, nothing substantive has come across my desk, but of course... There were riots in Frankfurt two weeks ago, which is interesting. And if you want to see the riots in Madrid and Rome and Frankfurt, you can't find it on European or British television. You have to look at Russia today, of all things. 
Um, so this has been hushed up. Most people in these countries, or that most people don't know there were riots in Frankfurt. Most people don't know there were riots in Madrid and Rome. Uh, it's being kept from the people because they're afraid that when people see what's happening, they too will take to the streets. Uh, and I can't see any way out of this because um, this is a political ideal. The euro was a political currency. Nobody wants it. It has no democratic mandate. Uh, the French voted against the new constitution. Uh, the British haven't been given a referendum, which is why UKIP is doing so well in the polls, because people are saying, just a minute, give us a say. Uh, and ordinary, ordinary people, middle America, uh, middle Germany, you know, middle Spain, middle France, middle England, people are saying, um, you know, we can't go on like this, uh, but the political class, the elite, are just, I would argue, just like the aristocracy of the old French during the Revolution, who ended up all getting their heads chopped off. And I can tell you, I made it one of my speeches. Uh, I said, sooner or later in the Parliament, they will storm this building and they will hang us and they will be justified. You know, on the subject of heads being chopped off, and you mentioned earlier... Um about news being blacked out in, in the UK of the riots. One of the biggest stories in your country in recent months, the, the decapitation of the British soldier walking down the street. Mr. Bloom, that story was totally blacked out in the United States. Very few Americans know that it ever happened. That's Good the type of censorship that's in this country. We don't, without, uh, other than outlets like True News, most news organizations in the United States never said a word about it. This is so depressing. I visit America frequently, and I've got so many American friends. And, of course, my party is broadly Atlanticist. You know, we, you know, we share, almost share, <laughs> a common language. Uh, and we share, our people share the same ideals. The sad thing is our politicians have let us down. We've been betrayed by our political class, both in America and the United Kingdom. Uh, these people live, um, they don't mix, they don't go to the pub, they don't go to the cricket club, they don't, your people don't go to minor league baseball anymore. Um, you know, the problem, except at election time. Uh, so these people don't live in the same world as the rest of us. They're completely detached. Uh, they have guaranteed salaries, guaranteed pensions, index linked. Uh, and in the Euro European Union, the bureaucracy don't pay income tax. So their salaries are tax free. So the bureaucracy and the uh, a vote for bigger, uh, uh, for bigger spending, higher government spending, but they're not part of that. They're out of that. Their p pensions are non contributory. Uh, so we have this political elite in Europe, and I would argue too. I don't know America quite so well. I'm a guest there. You just described. You just described thing. Washington. Yeah, I think I probably have. Yeah, I think I probably have. There's a total disconnect between the reality of the middle class in America and and the freak show that's in Washington. There's no Absolutely. connection between the two. And, of course, it's the poor old middle America, middle America. We're the people who create the money that they steal. Uh, you know, if, if we didn't get out of bed and work hard, there wouldn't be any money for them to steal. And they go on stealing it to give to their lobby groups and their friends and their buddies. Uh, I mean, we're now uh, a trillion pounds in debt, which for, for a small economy like ours is enormous. Uh, we are uh, in, in a situation where... Uh, we are nearly 200% of GDP in our debt, debt ratios, which is the same as Greece. And nobody's talking about that in England. There's a news blackout on that. But we're still giving away 0.9% of GDP uh, in overseas aid. So here we are with a Chancellor of the Exchequer in England saying he doesn't expect the country economy, the United Kingdom economy, to grow but much more than 1% for the entire 2014. And he says in the same breath, he's going to give that away. He's going to give that away. Uh, to, uh, to, to, for what? For Pakistan to buy F-18s? For African dictators to buy apartments in Paris? Ray-Ban sunglasses? Mercedes-Benz? What kind of nonsense is all this? Is socialism failing right before our eyes? Are we, are we the generation that is going to see the, the total failure of socialism? Well, again, it's, it, I think... I think the problem is you can't, you, water doesn't flow uphill. Uh, you, you can't buck the market. And what we have uh, experienced in, in, in Europe, and, and I sadly see the United States going the same way, uh, is the concept of welfareism, something for nothing. Um, 
and and people now it's it's generally speaking people better off at the at the, at the lower end of the scale are better off by not working uh, they're better off on social security uh, so if you have two or three children you're encouraged to breed and you are encouraged not to work and so you have uh, increasing unemployment and of course uh, this is what people now think. We now have a third generation, first world generation. I'm a baby boomer. I'm 63. Uh, but we have now a generation that's grown up who believe they are entitled. It is their God-given right uh, to be given free money by the state. And nobody associates tax or borrowing with the state. Pe- people are, It's not just politicians who are disconnected. People don't associate how they vote in the ballot box with how they're treated by politicians. Otherwise, nobody would vote for these scumbags, would they? That's right. Well, the reason I'm asking about the, the collapse of socialism, uh, the, the great Margaret Thatcher said many years ago that the problem with socialism is that eventually they run out of other people's money other to people's spend. Money. Well, they've run out of other people's money now. They're flat broke. So, they're flat broke, and they're printing. So they're printing, and, and, and so they're, they're trying to extend the life of the socialist regime. But at some point, that, too, will collapse. And the point I'm making is what you said earlier, it will be replaced by a total fascist dictatorship. I can't see any other way out, because I can't believe that a broken economy, with all the uh, implications that has would sit down rationally like you and me and probably most of your listeners and say what we should do. We need to roll back the state. We need small government um, and, uh, you know, low regulation, low taxation. I think what will happen is uh, that you'll have the same sort of phoenix-like rise from the ashes that we saw in the 1930s in Germany. And I think that's the sort of regime that you're going to see. And I think that... uh, and, and, and talking about gold, you were talking about gold earlier, uh, you know, I've been looking at that very carefully myself. But, of course, what we're actually seeing is paper gold uh, fall by 25%. Now, I don't believe with these ETFs and these paper gold certificates that the gold actually exists. Neither it's do being I. Shorted. It's being shorted uh, by the banks with the encouragement of central banks because as soon as people wake up and realize they have to kill the idea of gold, why would you hold paper money, dollars, which are being counterfeited, or pounds or euros, which you know are being counterfeited, when you could hold, hold gold? So this has been, this is a federal back, in my view. This is backed by the Fed, the central bankers across Western Europe, to destroy the idea of trying to get, you know, to try and stop people uh, returning to the gold standard uh, in their everyday transactions. And you saw, of course, in Arizona, Arizona uh, just uh, a few uh, a few weeks ago, uh, where they were going to take away the uh, the tax uh, on silver on silver coins, silver coinage, and that was vetoed by of all people a Republican governor um, because uh, the I think the the depth now of the malaise of central government, which I would argue started in your civil war. Um, that everything was run by Washington, and, and, and people have got to stand up. Your people have got to stand up to Washington uh, in the same way that we're trying to stand up to our, our government. But, of course, you've got the same problem in America. You vote Republican or Democrat. There's no other game in town, and that's the problem we've had for 15 years. People have voted Labour or they voted Conservative. They've voted Red or they voted Blue. And, of course, again, I, I would suspect it's probably the same in America. People are disengaging. People are disengaging. Uh, Nearly 50% of people in the United Kingdom just don't bother to vote at all. Um, Well, you know, I'm almost at the point I don't blame them because uh, it seems like voting only encourages them. I think that's right. You I know? think that's right. And, uh, and, of course, there is a school of thought. I think it was von Mises' school of thought who reckons, yeah, don't vote. Don't vote. Yes. Let nobody vote. Because you, we all know it doesn't make any difference. Uh, and maybe they think they've got some sort of democratic mandate. But these people are so detached and so intellectually stymied these people that they would they would ju- they wouldn't notice if nobody turned out to vote for them they they'd just carry on before i mean we've got a prime minister we've got a prime minister who when he was on american television last year he didn't know uh, when america came into the second world war he couldn't translate magna carta we are breeding politicians who uh, who possibly are the most ill-educated politicians 
um, in, in, in our country's history. Um, is it possible to breed men who don't know the first thing about their own country's history? And I think we have. And that reminds me of uh, when President Bush was in office. It was his press secretary, um, Dana Perino, um, and she was asked a question that, in regards to, to President Putin, made a remark about a second Cuban missile crisis. And they, they asked uh, the White House press secretary what the president thought about that remark. And she said, I, I don't know what Mr. Putin was talking about. What is the Cuban Missile Crisis? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's heartbreaking. But these are the people who seem to have got themselves into power. I mean, I do a lot of lecturing on the circuit as a, as a professional economist uh, or financial strategist. And if you go, to, say, to Warsaw, if you go to the Warsaw School of Economics, you will have youngsters there who can talk to you about any aspect of economics, any school of economics in some depth. And they can also talk to you about the Napoleonic Wars in the peninsula. You know, these are very rounded youngsters. I'm very sorry to say in the Anglosphere uh, these days, uh, they can barely grunt across the table at you. I mean, they're utterly hopeless. I mean, I wouldn't employ a, st a, a, a state-educated uh, economist. If somebody came in to my office when I was director of an investment bank and they said, oh, I graduated in economics at Edinburgh University. I certainly wouldn't employ them. I didn't have time to untrain them from their Keynesian nonsense. <laughs> it seems to me after 15 years in this uh, job uh, on the radio, uh, Mr. Bloom, that uh, we're, both of us, we're fighting the same regime. It's it, They are united across the Atlantic. There is a hidden... Uh, um, octopus that is directing the affairs of Western nations and and collapsing national sovereignty and and destroying the cultural heritage of the nations and and introducing multiculturalism and doing all kinds of things to just completely transform these nations. It's happening in the UK. It's happening here. It's happening in Holland. Are we talking about the Bilderberg boys? Who is behind this movement? Well, that's an interesting one. It's basically, isn't it, it's a choice between the conspiracy theory and the cock-up theory. Uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult one, and it depends what day you ask me. Um, sometimes I believe it has to be a conspiracy. And other days I think, no, when I meet them or I meet them in conference or... I realize just how stupid these people are. They're not, most of them, clever enough to make, put any form of conspiracy together. Um, so I think probably it just seems to be a, a course of events which is taking place because people uh, are not uh, properly educated. They don't understand the concept of law. I mean, for, uh, to give you uh, an example, and your legal system is very similar to ours, um, we believe in the presumption of innocence, trial by jury, the concept of habeas corpus. All these things are fundamental pillars of law, uh, and they're gradually being abandoned. But, of course, if you don't teach children in schools about what their rights and responsibilities are, if you don't talk to them about their history, it's very easy to take something away from them. And if, if people don't understand the concept of habeas corpus and the presumption of innocence, if they don't understand that, it's very easy to take that away from them. It's easy to steal something from somebody when they didn't know they had it to start with. And I believe that that's the problem. And we get things in, uh, in the United Kingdom called the Enabling Act. Uh, we have regulating uh, enforcement agencies who work completely outside the concept of English law. There are over 100 different agencies in the United Kingdom who have right of entry into your house. And, and you'll know the, the, the famous saying, an Englishman's home uh, is his castle. That's gone. The presumption of innocence has gone. Uh, you have to prove that you're innocent. I mean, uh, it, it's a complete nightmare. And once you move away from your legal uh, base, once you move away from your constitution, and what a tragedy it is in America, because because I think you've got a fine constitution. I think it's a splendid document, uh, which was designed by men to, to save us uh, or to save America from the very people uh, that are now uh, crucifying America. Uh, and it, because they've moved away from their, uh, their constitution, and of course what a lot of people don't even realize in England, is that we have a Bill of Rights. 
1688, we have an act of settlement. Uh, some of the wording from your constitution comes, as you know, from the British Bill of Rights. Uh, but people, people don't think we have a written constitution. Well, we don't in, 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 in exactly the same way as the United States of America, but we do have uh, a lot of stuff which is written down. Uh, the Queen's coronation oath, uh, all these things uh, are very tightly written and were very carefully written uh, in, in, in the late uh, in, uh, 17th century by us. So, you know, if, if people aren't taught that in schools... Um, it's easy for people to tear that constitution up. How many young American kids today, of let's say, you know, teenagers, uh, really could have an intelligent conversation with me about their own constitution, and I'm a foreigner? Um, you couldn't have an intelligent conversation with most politicians, school teachers, or college professors. They don't know. No. They don't know. They really don't know. They have no idea. The only thing people know today is what was on television. That's about yeah. it. They, that is their concept of reality. I, I know I need to let you go here very soon. I did want to ask you, the, the uh, recent weeks, uh, we have these uh, bombshell explosive uh, revelations about the NSA vast domestic spying operation here in the USA. And then it was revealed that uh, your country's GCHQ is uh, far surpassing everybody else, and they have taken the the king of the hill uh, title, and and they are intercepting six hundred million telephone calls per day worldwide, with uh, intercept devices on two hundred uh, fiber optic cables and undersea cables and everything. What are your thoughts about this official awareness? Things that we have known suspected for quite some time. What's your thoughts about this massive well, I surveillance? Think, uh, I, I think when you have what is a centralist and statist um, type of government, and, and that's evolved since the war, wars are very bad things. Uh, you know, we had the Great War, we had the Second World War, uh, and that's when governments take away your freedoms for your own good. And now this happens to be terrorism. They talk about, oh, we're taking away these things, we're spying on you for your own good. It's, uh, now, that is a conspiracy. Uh, and, of course, if you employ lots of people to be spies, you know, we mustn't be surprised when they spy, <laughs> because that's what they do. Uh, the CIA, you know, are all paid salaries in order to spy on people. And, of course, they have to invent the next bogeyman. Now that now the Soviet Union's collapsed, they're looking around for another bogeyman. Uh, and it's the same uh, in, in, in the United Kingdom. This war on terror is, is simply um, a way of taking away the remaining civil rights that we have. Um, and, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I just think we sooner or later we need to stand up to it. And I think we're a new party. Um, you know, we're a new party, UKIP, in, 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 uh, in the United Kingdom. I honestly believe that there needs to be a new political party in the United States. And I would argue that the good title for it would be the Constitutionalist Party, uh, which would just reinstate your original constitution. There actually is a Constitution Party in the United States. Is there? It, it's is on there? Uh, ballots in 39 states. Um, oh, I've learned. So. Well, there yeah. we are. What but it, doesn't, it doesn't get a lot of... Obviously, it gets no attention in the media, uh, no, but they, they have fielded uh, candidates every four years. But there is a constitution party, but uh, uh, there, it really needs money and support and, and credibility, but it does exist. And well, if uh, they keep working, my advice to them is to keep working, keep at it, uh, because we had 15 years of, uh, of this, and suddenly you break through one day. Uh, and you will break through, they will break through, stick to their guns, keep doing it. It may be not next year, it may not be in five years, but only a new party, I think, can rescue America, and they sound to me like they're the right people for it. And if you are someday the Chancellor of the Exchequer, I hope you'll come back on the program. I, well, I, I would be delighted to do so, and my very best wishes to uh, all my friends in America and potential friends. Uh, uh, we love our trips out there. All right. My guest today, Mr. Godfrey Bloom, member of the European Parliament, representing a district in Great Britain. Thank you, Mr. Bloom. Appreciate you taking Thank you. time. Thank you so much.